with some real good uh, geek credentials there. Welcome, <laughs> welcome, Hillary. <laughs> awesome. And then last, we got Bob Welch, who leads customer communications at 8451. Uh, his experience includes leadership roles at Dunhumby and IRI. And his fun digital fact, uh, Bob made his first e-com purchase in 1990, flowers from Prodigy for his wife. So there you go. <laughs> Cutting edge. All right, so a little bit about the format. We've got some prepared questions for the panelists that we'll run through, and they can build off each other. Uh, and then we'll save about five or ten minutes at the end for audience Q&A. So definitely save your hot topics and questions that we have not covered during the session. So just a quick warm-up question for you all. Uh, your favorite e-commerce or digital experience that's not your own, not your own brands. So this is going to be sort of a strange answer, but I'm going to say uh, Power Schools. How many people are familiar with Power Schools? Okay, so this is an app where you can have real-time visibility to every grade your child is getting. Uh, literally, like every assignment, did they turn it in on time? How are they doing in the class? Which, as a parent who is not there picking them up from school and doing homework every afternoon, the transparency that that creates and the, uh, let's just say, two-way dialogue um, that it facilitates is pretty powerful, so that's no pun intended. Awesome, thank you. All right, let's get into the real real topics here. So thinking about brands, start at the very beginning, which is our customers. And in our space, if you think of the last, say, three, five, 10 years, there's any number of changes we could talk about in customers' preferences, uh, their needs, and their requirements. So uh, the question for you all is, what do you see as the most important changes for our customers in, over the past couple of years? And how is, is your company or our company's uh, really delivering on that and addressing it. So we'll start with Jody. So for those of you who are familiar with uh, the Kroger company, we obviously have this very long history, um, 130 plus years of being the largest grocery uh, retailer. The transformation that is going on at Kroger is, is pretty incredible as we pivot to the digital, digital space. So when we talk about the customer changing, I think one of the things that um, we are most aware of is that we have to meet their needs in the context of their day. So it's not just about changing your strategy to say, hey, this is the new way that customers want to engage. It's changing your capabilities to address their needs that change every day. So. Um, to give a little bit of perspective on this, we've obviously had a meaningful in-store business for a long time. We now have added um, a very robust set of capabilities around pickup, delivery, and then ship to home. And when you think about all of those modalities working together, what a customer needs on Monday, when maybe they're running home and need a quick dinner to um, get the kids to soccer practice versus replenishing all of their household needs, which might be on Tuesday, versus you know on Thursday trying to think through the spectacular dinner party they're gonna throw and impress their friends with cool music on top of it. Like that context and meeting the customer every day as their needs change is critical. And so that's part of what we've been very much focused on is acknowledging that not only is there not one size fits all across customers, there's not one size fits all within the single customer. 
um, and being able to be nimble with your solutions to address that. Great, thank you. Ellery, any builds on what you see? Thank you. Let's shift a little bit to the underlying customer <laughs> customer uh, sentiment, which is all for us is in the data, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think about all of the current environment of data availability, the continuity of data, the depth and breadth that we have access to, um, we'll start with Bob. How, how are you thinking about or where do you see amazing uses of some of the new and in, in combination with uh, traditional data sources? Well, we have a lot to a huge amount of first party data that uh, we've been leveraging obviously you know since we, we started with uh, the OSB programs and a lot of that was the behavioral data so what did I buy who bought it uh, the evolution even just in the last couple of years of just understanding how they're engaging with this stuff um, what are they looking for why are they looking for being being able to provide that context is giving us many many more opportunities to tailor a personalized message maybe more relevant as you to the point of uh, not only can I, I see that you're building a basket, but I can see that you're building a bas basket because you have a soccer game, that you're bringing a bunch of stuff, or that you're having a party, and therefore how can we tailor the recommendations more to that? And so more and more and more we're tailoring both the content, the offer, the creative, all to you know, using all of that first party data that we can get at and eliminating waste in the system you know, as part of the process because we know these customers are doing X, Y, and Z, and so we know we can target them. But the best part about it is that we can then measure it because uh, we're not trying to model. We know exactly what's happened. And so it's not that we don't know what 50% of our advertisers are doing, this or that, the other. We, we know what 100% of it's doing. It may not be, all not be working, <laughs> uh, but you know, we're, we know what it, uh, how, how it's working. So I think that's the biggest change for us is not so much just the access to the first party data, it's that richness of the data that we have. So just a couple of things that I would build on top of what Bob said. So one thing, leveraging our data to sort of play back what the consumer is telling us and saying, okay, we know you buy Simple Truth 2% milk, we're gonna make sure when you search, that's the first result for you because that's the one that matters to you individually. What's exciting is when we move from sort of personalization with what we know to curation. So as the options expand for customers, being able to take what we know and apply that to say, you might also like, or here's some inspiration um, for new products or experiences that you might be interested in. Ellery talked a little bit about the clutter in our lives. I think consumers, and one of the things we're seeing in the data is, they want us to simplify, but they still want to discover. So how do you find that balance of presenting all these other options that are going to be relevant, but not what they do today? I think that's sort of the forward-looking step that we all have to embrace. The other thing, just on the topic of data that I will throw out, because I'm, a, I'm extremely passionate about this, is in the digital world in particular, we have to rethink the ways of working. So a phrase that we use a lot is continuous optimization. It is not um, the, the old methodologies of we're gonna build something, it's gonna take us six months to build it and it's gonna be perfect. I think what we all learn from the data is that nothing ever launches in a perfect way. So creating a cycle for your team where you're using data to have customer insights inform what you build, build it quickly, measure it, and then optimize it. 
And those cycles um, at the Kroger Company now range all the way from, you know, monthly, weekly, daily, inner day, um, where we're optimizing the experience based on the feedback that we're getting from customers. And, and that speed is the speed that consumers are expecting us to operate against now. So I think embracing that and not uh, resisting it is an important part of moving your organization forward. I have one other thing that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put in a plug for here, which is OKRs. I don't know how many people here are familiar with OKRs as a methodology for managing your organization, but historically, we had been very um, output focused. How many things can we get done? How many things can we get out there? And the shift to OKRs, which is really objectives and then key results, pivots the organization to outcomes. So using this <clears throat> new breed of talent that you're bringing in and the data that's available to say, what is the customer problem we're trying to solve? What's the key result we want to optimize for? And then give the teams autonomy to figure that out. So building against those outcomes um, has, been, has been very powerful for us. Great point. Thank you. All right, shifting a little bit now to modalities and supply chain. And I think as a customer, the way things show up to our doors and how we get things is ever evolving, right? And as a retailer, as a brand, we've got a whole new way to be able to create brand promises and a whole new set of complexities in how we deliver on those brand promises. Um, so starting Ellery with you and, and Kraft Heinz, what are some of the, the critical shifts you see in, in your investments and where you, you believe modality and supply chain is going.
Uh, so I'll, maybe I'll just build on that a little bit. So um, at Kroger, we've been building out, as you mentioned, a, a modality uh, portfolio, for, for lack of a better term, where you have the in-store experience, you have a pickup experience, which could be at a store or at some other location, lockers, et cetera. You have a delivery experience where we're bringing it to you either at your home, at your office, and then they're shipped to home. And I think one thing that is, is really important because customers want to have flexibility is having all of that work seamlessly together. So again, back to the comment around in the context of the consumer's day, how do you bring all those experiences to life together? And, and it's hard. It's, it's very complex and um, the proximity to the customer is critical. So one of the things that Kroger has really embraced is it really requires an ecosystem to deliver those best experiences. So I don't know how many of you have, have seen some of the articles about what we're doing with Ocado as an example of delivering a, a really, um, they've done an extraordinary job outside of the US with the delivery experience. We've got relationships with Neuro, which is an autonomous vehicle that will take your, your groceries from a Kroger store and drive it to your house um, without a driver. But finding who are all those partners, and, and partnership is a key focus moving forward, so that you can create the ecosystem to deliver um, what your customer needs in the most effective, cost effective, and highest quality way. Great. Thank you. Thinking about brand building, as we, we build on modalities, so that's how somebody shows up, right? A brand is going to show up via the person who's delivering it or the, the way and the method it gets to you. But it's also going to show up via all the ways we communicate with our customers. So knowing how much change has occurred in the past, say, decade of all the different mediums and ways to communicate and have that dialogue with our customers, how are we thinking about the omni-channel aspects of, of brand building in our space. I guess I'll start with Bob on that one. So we, you know, we saw an opportunity to uh, embrace the new engineer standard board to appropriately look at our approach to our customers and bring that brand persona. That there was an opportunity for us to really have uh, you know, insight from our customers in a large brand and an opportunity to have a very rich dialogue with our customers. So last year, Ellery, would you like to build on that a little bit?
depending on what the brand is about, uh, and allow us to connect with way, way more consumers and to be able to consistently bring them home. And so to the point of when you string everything together and create a coherent experience, whether they're in store or online, uh, understanding that an omni-channel consumer isn't a consumer who only shops in one place, only shops in another, but can show up anywhere, anytime within your ecosystem. Uh, it allows the brand to be much more personal to somebody, uh, the things that the brand stands for to matter a lot more. Uh, and for us as marketers to actually have the the certainty of who we reach. And so it's the, uh, I love the, you know, I know what of my marketing works. We know where it's working, who it's working with, uh, and the ability to specifically prescribe not just campaigns but programs, right? We want this segment. If they do this, then we go down this series of actions. If they do that, then we go down this series of actions. Do they get an offer? Well, that depends on their behavior. Are they signaling to us that that's valuable to them? Uh, the ability to basically f use technology to frame a one-to-one -one conversation is something that gets talked about a lot. The exciting thing is we're actually doing it here and it's working. I think the interesting part is that as part of that process, you also get full transparency on what works and what doesn't work. And for you know, we're all learning, but uh, as the brand teams go through and say, well, is that really the return I'm getting? Well, yes, and that is better than what you're getting <laughs> in, uh, in other places. How do we continue to refine it? So I think just that whole transparency on how my advertising dollars are working is helping to drive even a different way of thinking um, just in the whole planning process. So, And to that point, I mean, we, we've, you know, this is a year old, right? It, uh, we're still sort of in the dipping our feet into the water phase of this. Uh, we've learned what we can do with existing brands. I think where this is really going to come into its own is as we l start to launch brands with a mind to this is how we launch it because it's going to allow us to do new things, to be able to launch things we never could have launched before, uh, where this is going to be how we find the audience. Awesome. Let's continue down that path a little bit on the one-to-one -one concept, and I think we're getting much closer, and you said we're, we're almost living it today, and that one-to-one -one scale of we're able to provide personalized, personal messaging to customers. And that's two-way, right? That's really a dialogue between us and them. So if you think about the expansion of uh, AI and you know anything that goes along in that space and machine learning and the, the help that we get from our technology, how, how does that impact the, the life cycle of a customer and the way we're able to serve and service customers you know, as they have a problem, as they're coming into the brand, when they have a, an issue we need to deal with as we're trying to grow them. Can you all talk about that? Maybe Jody, start with you. Sure. Um, so one thing that I would say is, you know, we can't undervalue transparency with customers. With the rate at which we're all moving, we're going to make mistakes. Experiences aren't going to be perfect. A customer will always forgive you if you're, or in most cases forgive you, if you're transparent. If an order is going to be late, if an item is going to be missing, and you've proactively told them and set good expectations, the trust that you build through that two-way communication is, is critical. So I think really as you're, as you're thinking through how you want to optimize your organizations and your approach, thinking through that transparency with customers and sort of almost outweighing that beyond trying to be perfect because perfect is uh, fairly unattainable. Any builds, Ellery or Bob? I was going to say, customers um, in general, I think, put more trust in retailers to use their data. And we, we've seen it even just in surveys. They, they trust because they know that with that transparency that we are trying to help make their lives easier. And so that's you know, basically what we're striving for every day. Now, in the past, we would be able to say, this is what you purchased, and here's an offer that we, you know, we expect that you're going to be able to do that going forward. We were talking yesterday about using you know, machine learning uh, to be able to, on the fly, be able to understand what what am I doing right at this moment in terms of my basket, and I talked about it a little bit earlier around, I, I can see that you're doing something different and make that experience much more relevant. It's, it's again, about making that life, that whole transaction seamless and easier. And so with machine learning, we can use that to predict much more accurately now what is happening, what's in the consumer's head as they're walking the store in terms of the traffic pattern, or you know, on when they're on the site in terms of how they're engaging. And I think that's the next level that's gonna get that emotional connection or that, that extra loyalty from the customer because we're going above and beyond rather than just the, the functional aspect of, I got a good price and I'm gonna get the product in uh, two weeks or, or two weeks, two hours, sorry. 
there. Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> so one thing that I, I would just build on top of that is as we're putting those experiences forward, um, one of the mind shifts, again, that we've been embracing at Kroger is don't be uh, afraid to embrace the new technology, right? So you, you were talking about the in-store experience, and a lot of people say, look, when you're in-store, it's less of a digital experience. You're back to brick and mortar. Um, there is incredible work happening on the um, AR front, where when you think about bringing personalization to life, where you can be in-store and you can be holding up your phone and seeing your personalized offers, personalized experiences. We know something that, you know, you bought uh, skinless chicken breast, so now we're gonna serve up a recipe for you to fill out the rest um, of that meal so that you can make it for your family tonight. So embracing some of the new things that are happening, AR is one, voice is another that um, everybody should be paying attention to. Um, we've talked to our team about it because we're seeing where the customer is moving, and if you've placed a pickup order, planned out your whole basket, said these are the 21 items that I need to make or need to buy. And then you're in the kitchen, you're cooking, and you say, Ugh, I'm out of olive oil. You want to be able to say, hey, Google, add olive oil to my Kroger order. You want Google to know that means your simple truth, olive oil, right? So embracing these new technologies that the customer is very rapidly moving to at a pace beyond anything that we've seen before is critical as you think through your overall experience. The only thing I'd add to this too is, is you think about how do you minimize bad experiences that the consumer has. And for us, one of the things, and, and this kind of rips a little on where you were going, Bob, is if you add something, the technology now is good enough where we're experimenting with it now. Uh, it can go, okay, it looks like you're making chicken parmigiana for dinner, cool. Like we figured out from the things in your basket what you're planning to eat. You do not have eggs. Uh, are, you, are you sure you haven't forgotten them? And being able to surface that where like in the case where you go and you either go into the store or you put everything in your basket or you're ordering online, you go to place your order and it goes, we haven't seen you buy them in a while. Uh, so, you know, based on just knowing the rhythm of how you shop, we don't think you have any flag it up. Are you sure you haven't forgotten them? Oh my gosh, yes I have. Okay, add. You just saved dinner, right? So I think there's a lot of these places where we as humans are fallible and there are a lot of bad experiences we've just learned to accept as just that's how life is. Uh, and there's so many places where simple things can be solved by technology such that there are all these things we've learned to live with we may not have to. And those are the kind of pleasant surprises that are going to pull people back into being engaged in, in cooking dinner and eating from grocery. Uh, and, you know, at, at least as we see it, really reinvigorate our business. So one thing that I want to build on that, um, I think we're seeing collectively, we talked a little bit about this, the progression from the functional experience to the emotional experience. And exactly to your point, how do we take the more mundane things off of the consumer's list and just solve them for them. We, we think about um, lots of companies have talked about the subscription model, where today the current state of that is all the work is on the customer for them to say, I think I need toothpaste every 30 days. So I'm gonna put it on some subscription program, it's gonna come to me every 30 days. Well, what inevitably happens? If you look at the data, there is a massive fallout rate because the customers don't get it right. They actually need toothpaste every 17 days or every 37 days. So how can we, with all this you know, incredible data that we have, make sure you never run out on those mundane things, get them to you in an intelligent way, serving up, hey, you probably need toilet paper, let's make sure you don't run out of that, um, and allow the customer to focus on the more emotional or inspirational part of our category, which is making the meal, um, connecting with their family, connecting with their friends. So really shifting, you know, taking on more work for the customer and allowing them to be part of a more inspirational, emotional experience. Great. So we've got one, one prepared question left, and I want you all to put your futurist hats on and think about the broad shift to in food, grocery, the shift to e-commerce. And if you look at, say, the UK, which is going to hit 20% of their, their market in this space is, is getting there, and other areas of our, our industry have already gone this way, if you think about retail broadly, um, in 10 years, 
considering we'll see what happens, how, how big that percentage in five <laughs> years when grocery and food e-com really hits those double digit percentages of, of our industry, what are the aspects of the, the winning brands, the winning companies in, in that time frame? What's gonna make or break it? I think it's simplicity. Uh, I think if you look at the history of, of technology, uh, I can't think of a situation where a more complex solution has replaced a simpler one. Uh, every time something is disrupted and replaced, it's because something easier, that fewer steps, less friction replaces it. I think the brands that simplify their experience for the consumer, that make very clear what their proposition is, that offer solutions instead of products, uh, and that make technology not something where you notice and feel the technology, but where it's in the background working and the experience is just really simple, uh, are going to get to win. Uh, and I also think it's the ones that use technology to, um, to really like double down on the trust factor. Uh, technology can, is gonna split how you feel about something. It's either going to be alienating and the brand is gonna be that much further away, uh, there won't be people involved in it, or there will, right? Your ability to surface a problem, to have something predictively taken care of for you will, uh, will improve that. And so I think it's, uh, it's the people who lean in to learn that are, are gonna win. I mentioned you know, the, the hiring, learning, staffing piece. I think 100% of the battle comes down to the brands, the retailers, the people that get to win in this space, or the people who have the best people working on it. Uh, that's that's where this is going to come from. It, it is a people-driven thing, and, and when you look at uh, the retailers that are, are still alive and thriving today, and, and the ones that uh, that are business cases because they're no longer here, uh, that's what what it really came down to. And so, um, you know, what will it look like? I think your refrigerator will will stock itself, your pantry will stock itself, your cell phone will pop up a menu of what you can eat for dinner tonight, and that'll be entirely things that. Uh, a week in advance, uh, the machine learning predicted you would be interested in eating and all of the ingredients are already there and it knows that you've got some sort of activity uh, on Thursday night and it needs to be quick so it's going to give you five different things you can make for your family in less than 15 minutes, the ingredients for which are already taken care of. Uh, that's an experience so simple that, um, that it would be hard to get off of that. Uh, and so I think uh, we'll have fewer winners and the winners are gonna be the ones who can deliver the really magically simple but delightful experiences and the people who will be able to do that are the people who have the best people. Okay, so I'm gonna build on what he said. So everything that you just said, I completely agree with. Um, the talent piece, the one thing that I would build on top of it is listening to the customer. I mean, when you see the commonality between the companies that are succeeding and those who are struggling, it's how loud and present is the voice of the customer in what they do every day. And that comes in the form of customer insights. Um, it also comes in the form of customer insights that come through data and knowing how is that customer moving, being on top of that and having that be part of the dialogue every day with your teams. Um, circling back to the comment I made before about OKRs, OKRs start with what problem are we solving for the customer? The only way you know the right problems to solve is if you have those insights and you have that data. Um, it's a very, very powerful part of what takes companies sort of to the next level. Yeah, just, just a quick build, everything. Uh, that you, these guys said, but um, it is, you know, we, we absolutely need to be on top of every single channel and building the best experience and anticipating where it needs to go, but absolutely need to listen to the customer. And the, the simplest example I have is we still send out millions of uh, direct mail pieces every month. Um, and we send them out in paper, and it certainly would be easier to send them out in email, but we send them out in paper because customers respond better in the paper version. And, and we let the data tell us that. We let the, the customers tell us wh the way they respond. And so we're not gonna force a customer down a path because that's most efficient for us. We're gonna be prepared whatever channel that they wanna go into, but we're gonna listen to them and we're gonna deliver the best experience possible in whatever channel we have. But, um, but it, it is an evolution and some will be, go faster and some, uh, some won't. And we just need to be prepared to uh, deliver great on, on, on all of those areas. But. Awesome. All right, now it's time for audience participation. Any questions that we didn't cover? Anything you'd like to ask our panel? Uh, 
Um, have you found that most of the people, when they go online to place their order, they're more in a functional mode versus a discovery mode? And have you been able to successfully move some of them from functional to discovery? And how have you done that? Um, so it's a great question. I, I think today the vast, vast majority of experiences are functional. So individuals are coming, they're building a basket, they're thinking about what they need to do to stock their pantry. What we're starting to learn as we're building out some of those more inspirational experiences, whether that's shoppable recipes, uh, which is something that launched fairly recently for us, or experiences on the site that kind of blend content, promotions, products all together, when we get customers to engage on those experiences within the site, it converts at a much higher level and they spend more in their basket. So it isn't as pervasive as it needs to be. And I think that's, that's part of where both the in-store experience and the online experience needs to evolve where to some of the earlier points, you kind of move the mundane to something that we're taking care of more efficiently for them. As we present those inspirational experiences, we have data to say it's working. What we need to do is figure out new ways to serve that up more pervasively. Uh, we, we had a good discussion around like who's, who's killing it in that space? Who's doing it really well? And I think the honest answer is no one has nailed it. And we all have a lot of work to think about how do we bring that discovery and inspiration to customers? Because candidly, in the food space, like everyone's got to eat. Everyone needs to feed their family, needs to feed their friends. How do you make that a more emotional and satisfying experience? It's, it's a big challenge we all have. I don't know if anybody else wants to go. Any other questions? So my, my question, and I think it applies to any of you, but the, the interesting thing is that as we talk to a lot of people in the industry, we feel like there's a lot that is a must do, right? The, the future is, is open and it's going to happen. We all have to prepare for it. Now there's a lot that's a must do. Now some of it is going to be to create a strategic advantage for some of the players. What are some of the things we can think of and how can we frame it to identify what it is that I absolutely just must do to keep up with the rest of the industry versus what are the nice to haves that could eventually become a strategic advantage for either a retailer or a manufacturer? So this is, this is a very uh, persistent debate that goes on in any organization that's going through a digital transformation. It's the shiny objects of let's go do this cool feature that someone came up with versus what we call more the table stakes. So you can, there is tons and tons of data to, ver to verify this. If you don't have a high quality digital experience, and I'm talking basic stuff, uptime, response time, a search engine that works well, if those table stakes are not working well, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter what kind of inspirational experience you build. Um, the basics of just a high quality foundational experience should always, in, in my opinion and from my experience, take precedent over any bells and whistles. So that would be sort of point number one. Point number two in our space is being able to be nimble and flexible. I think um, Ellery, you'd called out like proximity to the customer. Being able to be close to your customers, not only in terms of hearing their feedback, but also like physically being able to get them what they need when they want it, that I would sort of put as that next tier. So if you've got the foundation right, then being able to much more um, thoughtfully address their needs as they change every day. And then you've got sort of the icing on the cake, which is all the new cool emerging technology. But get that foundation right, that will carry you farther than anything else that can happen in terms of new functionality. It's funny because I had so much confidence in that that I figured Jody already had that part nailed, <laughs> so I didn't need to worry about that. So from my perspective, it was, uh, you know, in the end, it's that emotional loyalty that we really have to work on because everyone's going to have a low price or everyone's going to be able to deliver in two hours. It's what are the other values? So we have, you know, assuming that all of the, the core is delivering on its, 
on its, its promises, it's that constant evolution to make sure we're maintaining that loyal connection you know, to a customer that they choose us over a hundred other options that they potentially have access to, particularly when you start to get into a ship world where you can get it from anywhere. You don't even have to go to the store. So I think that's for us what we're a bit obsessed about is that how do we maintain and stay ahead on that emotional loyalty component? The only thing I'll add on that, uh, if you just sort of uh, zoom way out on this, uh, we're at, you know, call it 2.x percent e-commerce penetration of grocery uh, right now. Uh, and if you believe the hypothesis that uh, e-commerce is a consolidation driving event in grocery, uh, then we know too little right now to say what's safe not to do. So I, I would almost say uh, I'm not yet to confidence calling anything like nice to have. I think in a couple of years we'll know better, but for right now, uh, I think uh, if you've decided you want to win, then you have to have a posture of default yes. Thank you so much to Ellery, Jody, Bob, and Jay. The next session starts at 1215. At Newsy, we believe opinions are a beautiful thing. But they belong to you, not us. We believe that news should inform, not influence. Newsy gives you stories rooted in facts and the research to back it up.